The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated station present Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busy themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro over the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that to our minds, as ours are to the beasts in the jungle, intellects, vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and truly drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the great disillusionment. It was near the end of October. Business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work, and sales were picking up. For the next 24 hours, not much change in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia, causing a low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of light gale force. Maximum temperature, 66. Minimum, 48. This weather report comes to you from the Government Weather Bureau. We now take you to the Meridian Room and the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York, where you will be entertained by the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. gentlemen. From the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. With a touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Comparecita. <laughs> gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8 central time, Professor Farrell of the Mount Jennings Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving towards the Earth with enormous velocity. Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation and describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun, unquote. We now return you to the music of Raymond Raquello, playing for you in the Meridian Room of the Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York. Thank you. 
And now, a tune that never loses favor, the ever-popular Stardust. Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with the noted astronomer Professor Pearson, who will give us, uh, give us his views on the event. In a few moments, we will take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. to take you to the Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Carl Phillips, speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. I'm standing in a large semicircular room, pitch black except for an oblong slit in the ceiling. Through this opening, I can see a sprinkling of stars that cast a kind of frosty glow over the intricate mechanism of the huge telescope. The ticking sound you hear is the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through a giant lens. I ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise during our interview. Besides his ceaseless watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or other communications. During this period, he is in constant touch with the astronomical centers of the world. Professor, may I begin our questions? At any time, Mr. Phillips. Professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A red disk swimming in a blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disk. Quite distinct now because Mars happens to be at the point nearest the Earth. In opposition, as we call it. In your opinion, what do these transverse stripes signify, Professor Pearson? <laughs> Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips. Uh, although that's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions peculiar to the planet. Then you're quite convinced as a scientist that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars? I'd say the chances against it are a thousand to one. And yet, how do you account for these gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Mr. Phillips, I cannot account for it. Oh, by the way, Professor, for the benefit of our listeners, how far away is Mars from Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. Well, that seems like a safe enough distance. Thank you. Uh, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has handed Professor Pearson a message. While he reads it, let me remind you that we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer, Professor Pearson. One moment, please. Professor Pearson has just passed me a message that he's received. Professor, may I read the message to our listening audience? Certainly, Mr. Phillips. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you the wire addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Tyson of the Natural History Museum in New York City. 9.15 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. Seismograph registered shock of almost earthquake intensity occurring within a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate. Signed, Dr. Tyson, Chief of Astronomical Division. 
Professor Pearson, could this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? <laughs> Hardly, Mr. Phillips. This is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this particular time is merely a coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Oh, thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past ten minutes, we've been speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton, bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are now returning you to our New York studio. bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News, Toronto, Canada. Professor Morse of McGill University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now, nearer home comes a special announcement from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Prince, uh, Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene and will give you our commentator, Carl Phillips. We will have him give you a word description as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Marinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millette and his orchestra are, are offering a program of dance music. We take you now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again at the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in about 10 minutes. Well, I, I hardly know where to begin to paint a word picture for you of the strange scene before my eyes. It's like something out of a modern Arabian Nights. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. Uh, I, I guess that's it. Uh, yes, I, I guess that's the, the thing uh, directly in front of me. It's half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with the splinters of a tree it must have struck on its way down. Uh, what I can see of the uh, object itself doesn't look much like a meteor, at least not uh, the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. It has a diameter of, uh, oh, I don't know. What would you say the diameter is, Professor? Uh, about 30 yards. Uh, yeah, about 30 yards. Uh, the metal on the sheath is, well, I've, I've never seen anything like it. Uh, the color is sort of yellowish white. Uh, curious spectators are now pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. Uh, they're getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, would you mind standing to one side, please? One, sir, one side there. I just want to see it. Get back. Um, While well, the policemen are pushing the crowd back, uh, I have found Mr. Wilmoth, the owner of the farm here. He may have something interesting to add. Uh, Mr. Wilmoth, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember this rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard? Step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmoth. Well, well, I was, I was listening to the radio. Uh, closer and uh, speak louder, please. Uh, pardon me? Uh, louder, please, and closer. Yes, sir. Well, I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsing. That professor fellow was talking about Mars. I was half dozing and half drowsing. Yes, yes, Mr. Wilmoth. Then what happened? And as I was saying, I was listening to the radio kind of halfway. Yes, Mr. Wilmoth. Then you saw something? No, not first off. I heard something. Oh, what did you hear? A hissing sound. Like this. Kind of like a 4th of July firework. Then what happened? Turned my head out the window and I would have sworn I was asleep and dreaming. Yes, yes. I seen a kind of greenish streak, and then zingo, something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, I, I guess you were frightened then, weren't you, Mr. Wilmoth? Well, I... I ain't sure. I, 
I reckon I was I was riled. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilma. Thank you. You want me to tell you more? I got no, more no, that's quite all right. Really uh, that's plenty. No, no, no. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from Mr. Wilmoth, owner of the farm where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us. Police are trying to rope off the roadway leading to the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. Car headlights throw an enormous spot on the pit where the object's half buried. Some of the more daring souls are now venturing near the edge. Their silhouettes stand out against the metal sheen. Uh, one man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with the policeman. Uh, the policeman wins. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but now it's becoming more distinct. Uh, perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Uh, listen closely. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to be coming from inside the object. I'll move the microphone nearer. Uh, we're now not more than 25 feet away. Can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson! Yes, Mr. Phillips. Can you tell us the meaning of this humming noise inside the thing? Uh, possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. Uh, the metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial, uh, not found on this Earth. Friction with the Earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and, as you can see, of cylindrical shape. Uh, just a minute. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. What is that? The top is beginning to rotate like a screw. This thing must be hollow. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed. Wait, wait a minute. Someone's crawling out of the hollow top. Uh, someone or, or, or something. Uh, I can see peering out of that black hole two luminous discs. Um, are they eyes? It might be a face. It, it might be. Good heavens! Something's wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. And now it's another one. They look like tentacles to me. There, I see the thing's body. It's large, large as a bear, and it glistens like wet leather. But that face, it. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable. I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. The, the monster, or whatever it is, can hardly move. It seems weighted down by possibly gravity or something. Uh, the thing's rising up. Uh, the crowd falls back now. They've seen plenty. This is the most extraordinary experience. I, I can't find words. I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description now until I can take a new position. Uh, hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. We now return you to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back of a stone wall that adjoins Mr. Wilmoth's garden. Uh, from here I can get a sweep of the whole scene. I'll give you every detail as long as I can, as long as I can see. Uh, more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. There's about 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain is conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Uh, they've parted. The professor's moving around one side. He's studying the object. Uh, the captain and the two policemen advance with something in their hands. Uh, I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole, a flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait, something's happening. A hump shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against the mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror. It leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. Good Lord, they're turning into flame. Now the whole field's caught fire. The woods, the barns, the gas tanks of automobiles. It's spreading everywhere. It's coming this way. It's off to the right, 20 yards to my right, coming this way. It's over here. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest opportunity. 
In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Indelkoffer, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical Society, expressed that the opinion of the explosions on Mars are undoubtedly nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We now continue with our piano interlude. handed a message that came in from Grover's Mill by telephone. Just a moment. At least 40 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of the village of Grover's Mill, their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. The next voice you hear will be that of Brigadier General Montgomery Smith, commander of the state militia at Trenton, New Jersey. I have been requested by the governor of New Jersey to place the counties of Mercer and Middlesex as far west as Princeton and east to Jamesburg under martial law. No one will be permitted to enter this area except by special pass issued by state or military authorities. Four companies of state militia are proceeding from Trenton to Grover's Mill and will aid in the evacuation of homes within the range of military operations. Thank you. You have just been listening to General Montgomery Smith commanding the state militia at Trenton. In the meantime, further details of the catastrophe at Grover's Mill are coming in. The strange creatures, after unleashing their deadly assault, crawled back into their pit and made no attempt to prevent the efforts of firemen to recover the bodies and extinguish the fire. Combined fire departments of Mercer County are fighting the flames which menace the entire countryside. We have been unable to establish any contact with our mobile unit at Grover's Mill, but we hope to be able to return you there at the earliest possible moment. In the meantime, we take you... Just one moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been informed that we have finally established communication with an eyewitness of the tragedy. Professor Pearson has been located at a farmhouse near Grover's Mill where he has established an emergency observation post. As a scientist, he will give you his explanation of the calamity. The next voice you hear will be that of Professor Pearson, brought to you by Direct Wire. Professor Pearson. Of the creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grover's Mill, I give you no authoritative information either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. Of their destructive instrument, I might venture some conjectural explanation. For want of a better term, I shall refer to the mysterious weapon as a heat ray. It's all too evident that these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. The intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. That is my conjecture of the origin of the heat ray. Thank you, Professor Pearson. Ladies and gentlemen, here is a bulletin from Washington, D.C. Office of the Director of the National Red Cross reports 10 units of Red Cross emergency workers have been assigned to the headquarters of the state militia stationed outside Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Here's a bulletin from State Police, Princeton Junction. The fires at Grover's Mill and vicinity are now under control. Scouts report all quiet in the pit and no sign of life appearing from the mouth of the cylinder. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special statement from Mr. Harry McDonald, Vice President in Charge of Operations. We have received a request from the militia in Trenton to place at the disposal of the entire broadcasting facilities. In view of the gravity of the situation and believing that radio has a responsibility to serve the public interest at all times, we are turning over our facilities to the state militia in Trenton. We take you now to the field headquarters of the state militia near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. 
This is Captain Lansing of the Signal Corps, attached to the state militia now engaged in military operations in the vicinity of Grover's Mill. Situation is now under complete control. The cylindrical object, which lies in a pit directly below our position, is surrounded on all sides by eight battalions of infantry. All cause for alarm, if such cause ever even existed, is now entirely unjustified. The things, whatever they are, do not even venture to poke their heads above the pit. I can see their hiding place plainly in the glare of the searchlights here, and with all their reported resources, these creatures can scarcely stand up against heavy machine gun fire. There appears to be some slight smoke in the, ri in the woods bordering the Millstone River. We ought to see some action soon. One of the companies is deploying on the left flank, and a quick thrust and it will all be over. Now wait, wait a minute. I see something on top of the cylinder. No, no, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmoth Farm. 7,000 armed men closing in on some old metal tube. Wait, that, that, that wasn't a shadow. It's something moving, something metal. Kind of shield-like affair rising up out of the cylinder. It's going higher and, and higher. Why, it's standing on legs. Actually rearing up on some sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights are on it. It's getting closer. Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle which took place tonight at Grover's Mill has ended in one of the most startling defeats ever suffered by any army in modern times. 7,000 men armed with rifles and machine guns pitted against a single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors, the rest strewn over the battle area from Grover's Mill to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death under the metal feet of the monster or burned to cinders by its heat ray. The monster is now in control of the middle section of New Jersey and has effectively cut the state through its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Railroad tracks are torn and service from New York to Philadelphia discontinued except routing some of the trains through Allentown and Phoenixville. Highways to the north, south, and west are clogged with frantic human traffic. Police and army reserves are unable to control the mad flight. By morning, the fugitives will have swelled Philadelphia, Camden, and Trenton. It is estimated to twice their normal population. At this time, martial law prevails through New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania. We take you now to Washington for a special broadcast on the national emergency. The Secretary of the Interior. Citizens of this nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and properties of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you, private citizens and public officials, all of you, the urgent need for calm and resourceful action. Fortunately, the formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area, and we may place our faith in our military forces to keep them there. In the meantime, placing our faith in God, we must continue the performance of our duties, each and every one of us, so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous, and consecrated to the preservation of human superiority on this earth. I thank you all. You have just heard the Secretary of the Interior speaking from Washington. Bulletins too numerous to read are piling up in the studio here. We are informed the central portion of New Jersey is blacked out from radio communication due to the effect of heat ray upon power lines and electrical equipment. Cables have been received from the English, French, and German scientific bodies offering assistance. Astronomers report continued Gauss outbursts at regular intervals on planet Mars. Majority voice opinion that enemy will be reinforced by additional rocket machines. 
attempt made to locate Professor Pearson of Princeton, who has observed Martians at a close range. It is feared he was lost in the recent battle. Langham Field, Virginia. Here's a bulletin from Basking Ridge, New Jersey. Hunters have stumbled on a second cylinder similar to the first embedded in the Great Swamp, 20 miles south of Morristown. Army field pieces are proceeding from Newark to blow up the second invading unit before the cylinder can be opened and the fighting machine rigged. They are taking up position in the foothills of Wachung Mountains. Another bulletin from Langham Field, Virginia. Scouting planes report enemy machines now three in number, increasing speed northward, kicking over houses and trees in their evident haste to form a conjunction with their allies south of Morristown. Machines also sighted by telephone operator east of Middlesex within 10 miles of Plainfield. Here's a bulletin from Winston Field, Long Island. Fleet of army bombers carrying heavy explosives flying north in pursuit of enemy. Scouting planes act as guides. They keep speeding enemy in sight. Just a moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run special wires to the artillery line in adjacent villages to give you direct reports in the zone of the advancing enemy. First, we take you to the battery of the 22nd Field Artillery, located in the Wachung Mountains. Range, 32 meters. 32 meters. Projection, 39 degrees. 39 degrees. Fire! 140 yards to the right, sir. Shift range, 31 meters. 31 meters. Projection, 37 degrees. 37 degrees. Fire! A hit, sir. We got the tripod on one of them. They've stopped. The others are trying to repair it. Quick, get the range. Shift 30 meters. 30 meters. Projection, 27 degrees. 27 degrees. Fire! Can't see the shell land, sir. They're letting off the smoke. What is it? A black smoke, sir, moving this way, lying close to the ground, and it's moving fast. Better put on gas masks. <coughs> We're going to fire. Shift 24 meters. 24 meters. Projection 24 degrees. 24 degrees. Fire! Still can't see, sir. The smoke's coming nearer. Get the range. 23 meters. <laughs> 23 meters! 23 meters! Projection! 22 degrees! 22 degrees! Army bombing plane B843 off Bayo, New Jersey. Lieutenant Boat commanding eight bombers. Reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. This is Boat reporting to Commander Fairfax Langham Field. Enemy tripod machines now in sight. Reinforced by three machines from Morristown Cylinder, six altogether. One machine already crippled. Relieved hit by shell from Army Gun in Wachung Mountains. Guns now appear silent. A heavy black fog hanging close to the earth. Of extreme density, nature unknown. No sign of heat ray. Enemy now turns east, crossing Passaic River into the Jersey Marshes. Another straddles the Pulaski Skyway. Evident objective is New York City. They're pushing down a high tension power station. The machines are close together now. We're ready to attack. Planes circling, ready to strike. A thousand yards, and we'll be over the first. 800 yards, 600, 400, 200. There they go. The giant arm raised. Green flash! They're spraying us with flame. 2,000 feet, eggs are giving out. No chance to release bombs, only one thing left. Drop on them, plan and all. We're done with the first one. Now the engine's gone. Eight. This is Bayo, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. This is Bayo, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. This is Langham Field. Go ahead. Eight army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. Engines incapacitated by heat ray, all crashed. One enemy machine destroyed. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in the direction of... This is Newark, New Jersey. This is Newark, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring in from Jersey marshes. Reaches South Street. Gas masks useless. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 7, 23, and 24. Avoid congested areas. 
Smoke now spreading over Raymond Boulevard. 2X2L, call in CQ. 2X2L, call in CQ. 2X2L, calling 8X3R. Come in, please. This is 8X3R, calling back to 2X2L. 8X3R. How's reception? How's reception, Kay, please? Where are you, 8X3R? What's the matter? Where are you? I'm speaking from the roof of the Broadcasting Building, New York City. The bells you hear are ringing to warn the people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchinson River Parkway still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island, hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed 10 minutes ago. No more defenses. Our armies wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything wiped out. This may be the last broadcast. We'll stay here till the end. People are holding service below us in the cathedral. Now I look down the harbor. All manner of boats overloaded with fleeing population pulling out from the docks. Streets are all jammed. Noise in crowds like New Year's Eve in city. Wait a minute. Enemy now in sight above the Palisades. Five, five great machines. First one is crossing the river. I can see it from here. Wading the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. A bulletin's handed me. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. One outside Buffalo. One in Chicago, St. Louis, seem to be timed and spaced. Now the first machine reaches the shore. He stands watching, looking over the city. His steel cowlish head is even with the skyscrapers. He waits now for the others. They rise like a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting their metal hands. This is, this is the end now. Smoke comes out, black smoke drifting over the city. People in the streets see it now. They're running towards the East River, thousands of them dropping in like rats. Now the smoke's spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People trying to run away from it, but it's no use. They're falling like flies. Now the smoke's crossing 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue, 100 yards away. It's 50 feet. <coughs> 2X2L calling CQ. 2X2L calling CQ. 2X2L calling CQ. New York, isn't there anybody on the air? Isn't there anybody on the air? Isn't there anybody? 2X2L. You are listening to a CBS presentation of Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in the original dramatization of The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. The performance will continue after a brief intermission. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. As I set down these notes on paper, I'm obsessed by the thought that I may be the livest, last living man on earth. I had been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures in the world now seems part of another life. I look down at my blackened hands, my torn shoes, my tattered clothes, and I try to connect them with a professor who lives at Princeton and who on the night of October 30th glimpsed through his telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, 
my books, my observatory, my, my world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? In writing down my daily life, I tell myself I shall preserve human history between the dark covers of this little book that was meant to record the movements of the stars. But to write, I must live, and to live, I must eat. I find moldy bread in the kitchen and an orange none too spoiled to swallow. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. Morning, sun streams in the window. The black cloud of gas has lifted and the scorched meadows to the north look as though a black snowstorm has passed over them. I venture from the house. I make my way to a road, no traffic. Here and there a wrecked car, baggaged overturned, a blackened skeleton. I push on north. For some reason I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them and I keep a careful watch. I have seen the Martians feed. Next day I came to a city vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its buildings strangely dwarfed and leveled off as if a giant hand sliced its highest towers with a capricious sweep of his hand. I reached the outskirts. I found Newark undemolished, but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. I came at last to the Holland Tunnel. I entered that silent tube, anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of, a, of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. I stood alone on Times Square. I caught sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaws and a pack of starving mongrels at his heels. I walked up Broadway, past silent shop windows displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks. Near Columbus Circle, I noticed models of 1939 motor cars in the showrooms facing empty streets. From over the top of the General Motors building, I watched a flock of black birds circling in the sky. I hurried on. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine, standing somewhere in Central Park, gleaming in the late afternoon sun. An insane idea, I rushed recklessly across Columbus Circle and into the park. I climbed a small hill above the pond at 60th Street. From there I could see, standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their great steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground, and there before my eyes, stark and silent, lay the Martians. With the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. Later, when their bodies were examined in the laboratories, it was found that they were killed by the putrefactive and diseased bacteria against which their systems were unprepared, slain, after all man's defenses have failed, by the humblest thing that God in his wisdom put upon this earth.
This is Orson Welles, ladies and gentlemen, out of character to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. The Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet and jumping out of a bush and saying, Boo! Boo! Starting now, we couldn't soap all your windows and seal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the best next thing. We annihilated the world before your very ears and utterly destroyed the Columbia Broadcasting System. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So goodbye, everybody, and remember the terrible lesson you learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch. And if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, it was no Martian, it's Halloween. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and uh, thanks to all of our crew, our cast, our musicians, and our tech support as well.